I thank you for your support and your watching of this video and other videos. It is appreciated. If you like the video, do not forget to press a like. We are going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is a grand chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, a series of key parables. We are going to be looking at verses 1 to 13 and the first parable in this chapter. Matthew chapter 25, reading from the New American Bible. The reign of God can be likened to ten bridesmaids who took their torches and went out to welcome the groom. Five of them were foolish, while the other five were sensible. The foolish ones, in taking their torches, brought no, no oil along. But the sensible ones took flasks of oil as well as their torches. The groom delayed his coming, so they all began to nod, then fall asleep. At midnight, someone shouted, The groom is here, come out and greet him. At the outcry, all the virgins woke up and got their torches ready. The foolish one said to the sensible, Give us some of your oil. Our torches are going out. But the sensible ones replied, No, there may not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy yourself some. While they went off to buy it, the groom arrived, and the ones who were ready went into the wedding with him. Then the door was barred. Later, the other bridesmaid came back. Master, master, they cried, open the door for us. But he answered, I tell you, I do not know you. The moral is this, keep your eyes open, for you know not the day or the hour. So in Matthew chapter 25, we have a series of parables, three major parables that take up a longer chapter. And each of these parables build off the theme of the Lord's return and how to prepare for that moment. The first parable we will, which we look at here is taken from a slice of everyday life. When you read this parable, it, it comes across as strange to us, and some of the language that is used here is strange. We would not, for example, in modern culture, due to sensibilities, call a bride to be a virgin for a number of reasons. So if you get past that, understand what we are talking about is a bride and understand in that time and place the expectation that that bride would not have consummated the relationship and that bride in that sense would be pure. So when you get beyond that just understand that this is a slice of everyday life about the procedures and processes that lead to marriage in that time and place. So the first major step in the marriage process would be an agreement now, generally speaking, this would be between the parents of the bride and the groom. And understand that they would set up a, what we would call a contract, but not quite. You know, in terms of an agreement, the bride would bring into the relationship a dowry. And then they would agree that this couple, the parents, would be married. So there is a formal commitment to that. But in the meantime, there was a period of time where the bride would remain at home. And this seems more or less to be a window of opportunity for the groom to prepare his home and prepare for the taking in of his bride. You see, in that day and age, one did not simply decide who he or she would marry. It was a decision considered far too important to leave to just the kids. Now, once this couple was betrothed, once the agreement was set up, once the details were worked out, this couple was, for all intents and purposes, married. But the relationship would not be consummated to the actual wedding night. So the bride-to-be would remain in the, for the time, it would remain in her father's home. So the period of betrothal, that period that we consider in modern terminology, the engagement period, would be lived out in the father's home. The wedding would be focused on the transference of the bride from one household to another. 
So when you think of a wedding today, what do we think of? Often we think of a, a ceremony where maybe a couple of hundred people gather to watch a bride and groom go down the aisle of a stately place, traditionally a church, but nowadays it's more and more not. And so you have a couple hundred people, then you have a meal afterwards, and then the honeymoon begins. That's how we view a wedding. In that time and in that place, a wedding was different. It was when a groom showed up on the wedding night and took the bride and, as it were, physically moved that person into their home. That was their picture of a wedding. Notice, it's not the same as our picture because there is a sense in which those things that we associate with a wedding, the signing of the documents, the formal commitments and pledges, were stuff that was done months before. So understand from the time of betrothal, there was an element of time when you knew you were going to be formally married, but you were not formally married. Now, what we're saying it was not a quick and sudden event. And this time there would be the anticipation of the wedding night. There was no doubt that you were about to be married. So you knew that. You were working in that sense too and preparing for that moment. There would be no real sense for a person not to be prepared for the coming event. The fact that there were five young ladies not ready for that night by having the required oil for their lamps would probably be heard as humorous to the original audience. Like a lot of Jesus's parables, there is a start in the world of the everyday, and there's often just kind of this little twist which steps outside of the reality as understood in that time. The day in which the groom would come and get his bride would be too determined in advance. The point of the betrothal would be to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. The focus would be on that event, but realize there were no clocks back then. You know, they could not pull up their smartphone and, you know, on that day in their calendar, put in that date at that time, I can expect my groom to come and take me into his home. They could not, you know, they did not have mechanical markers of time. So there's a sense in which time was approximate. They knew the day of, but the actual time was more fluid because of the lack of precision in time. The sense of uncertainty is captured in this parable. In the meantime, until that day and hour, the bride would carry on with the normal routines of life. This was all normal stuff that would have been understood well by the first century audience. The parable may be brief in details, but like a lot of parables, understand that what Jesus was probably drawing on was the experiences of the people to fill in the detail. The emotions, too, would enter in and what people were feeling that way. Jesus did not have to give all of this because this is what people would supply and provide. The believer in Jesus knows that Jesus is coming. The believer in Jesus understands that we all must appear before him. You see, like, we, like the bride, know what will be. We, like the bride, do not know the time exactly. You see, the fact is, we know it's going to happen. We can know that within 70 years, our life is going to be over. So whether he comes in our lifetime or not, that time is brief. If you think about it, it really should not change anything. In a way, that is the point of the parable. There is no excuse for not being ready. That's the underlying point of this parable. Yes, you have a life to live and things to take care of, but five of those brides were not ready. It is possible to be both ready and to be focused on life here and now. Notice that. You can be ready for Jesus' coming and focused on life here and now. These are not mutually exclusive lives. We are to live each day as if it is our last. This is the kind of mentality that we need, for we know that the day, that, no, this day, that he will come for us.